So hi, there we go. Hi everyone, and welcome to the first event from the newest cohort of the Internet Law and Policy Foundry. The Foundry is a collaborative organization for those passionate about internet law, policy, and innovation. Each year, the Foundry brings together early career law and policy innovators as fellows for planning and executing uh, initiatives and activities just like this one. So today, we kickstart our very first of many events as fellows. And in celebration of Women's History Month, we're joined by some incredible past female Foundry fellows to learn from their experiences with the Foundry uh, and to learn their stories from their incredible careers in the tech and internet policy and legal space. Uh, so my name is Rima Musa. I'm a current fellow uh, of this uh, year's Foundry class, uh, and I'll be co-moderating this event with Arpitha Desai. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to her now to introduce our panelists. Thanks, Rima. Um, so we'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. Um, first up, we have Ashkin, who is a tech policy expert. She manages and develops policy projects on free speech, content moderation, surveillance reform, and the intersection of constitutional rights and technology. Ashkin joined Facebook, now Meta, in November of 2020 as their content policy manager on the content regulation team. Next up, we have Ali, who is the vice president of the, of the information policy team at the Computer and Communications Industry Association, where she focuses on intermediary liability, copyright, and other areas of intellectual property. She is also an inaugural fellow at the ILPF. And last up, we have Anisha, who is a technology attorney at Zendesk, currently focusing on privacy law. She is also a board member of the South Asian uh, Bar Association of Northern California, a certified information privacy professional, and also a former fellow. So we really thank you for joining us. Um, and I think now we can go ahead and launch into our questions for our panelists. And I think um, Rima will get us started. Yeah, thank you, Arpitha, for introducing our panelists. And let's start off by hearing a little bit more about all of their amazing backgrounds. So you've all had a great journey so far, uh, but what made you choose a career in internet and tech uh, law and policy? And we'll start with, uh, with Ashkin, then go to Ali, and then Anisha. Sure, thank you so much for that question. Uh, to be honest, it's a little painful to talk about the roots of how my po tech policy started. And in a second, you'll understand why. I was born and raised in Russia and I went to undergrad law degree college in Russia. And that was when kind of my journey into this world began. I was very interested in free speech. Wow, that is a work notification I forgot to turn off. Um, uh, I was um, kind of drawn into the free speech world uh, because in 2007, when I started college, Russia was cracking down on any independent opposition news media, and everyone kind of moved to the internet as their last bastion of organization and information sharing and truth sharing or, you know, anything that was in the government line. And that's kind of a free speech led me to the internet regulation because that's where all the cutting edge issues were. And then when I moved to the United States and went to law school here, that continued. And that led me to DC. And it is also not only painful because for example, now everything I have said about the Russian government can easily fall under new criminal um, positions they've adopted and people are prosecuted for criticizing the government and criticizing the war. Uh, but on top of it, uh, for the last five years I've been in DC, I often talk about uh, regulating free speech online and government intervening in speech. And I always talked about the experiences I had back in Russia and a lot of people, both on the left and the right actually made fun of me and said that I was being too intense or that I was kind of exaggerating how things can escalate in the 21st century. And this year we're living through and seeing what it really means. We're seeing Russia trying to shut down their own citizens from the rest of the internet so they don't get to see what's happening and you know real information and fact checks and things like that. And just access to a different opinion that's not the government's opinion. So 
I guess I told you so, but also I wish I wasn't right. Um, and that's the way my journey led me to DC and to the foundry. I don't have to follow that, but um, Ash, thank you for, for, for your work and um, all the challenges, but um, really feel grateful to, to know you as a colleague and your work defending the internet and speech. Uh, so I, um, Ash mentioned 2007, I'll, I'll tell my story, which mentions 2008, which was that when I was, um, I kind of didn't know what to do with my life when I was, I was in college, I changed majors, I, I um, changed, I transferred schools, I didn't, I was like government, math, computer science, music, I didn't know. And then um, I ended up uh, finding, um, uh, I, I was like 2008, I, um, I put some Beatles, a Beatles cover on my MySpace page because again, I keep saying how old I am. <laughs> First class, 2008, and and so I remember talking to some scholars at the time about things around copyright and, and music and the internet, and just found those issues to be so interesting. And it really seemed to combine so many of the random things that um, I found interesting and important around um, creativity and innovation and the, the public and um, openness and and just. Uh, really got interested in that really unique um, intersection and decided to go back and write a thesis about um, my senior year about mashups and fair use that if I read now would be probably really embarrassing when girl talk but uh, and then I applied to law school and I um, was really interested from the beginning in public interest um, related copyright and other areas of IP and um, I've been with my, my current employer in, in I moved to DC, to, uh, to DC for law school at, at American, started at my current employer, CCIA, before my third summer and just, just never left. I've been here my whole career. And so still continue to do a lot of work on, on copyright, um, which is an, an active area that the Supreme Court granted a, um, a fair use case today, which is really interesting. But um, in addition to that work on copyright, I've gotten more into um, inter intermediary liability, content moderation, things around section 230. And um, those are really active areas as well at the federal level, state level, international level, et cetera. So um, I, but I found that those challenges so interesting and really liked to get uh, the opportunity to get to work together with so many unique coalitions of um, companies and, and, and other trade associations, but also civil society organizations, libraries, just groups across the political spectrum and um, love to get to, to work together to, to defend these issues and um, being part of the boundary and, from its from um, since it began has been really interesting and important to me too. So such a great um, community of of, of, of up and coming um, students and, and alumni and and um, advocates that are lawyers, um, policy experts, technologists. So so many really great um, folks, including a lot of great women. So it's it's great to be with with you all here today. Thank you so much. Thanks both. Those are those are both awesome stories. And I think it's always really cool to hear about how people get into this space because everybody has such a different background and reason for staying in it. <laughs> when um I and I do think there is a reason that that this is such a hot space right now as well. So um, you know, my story is is probably a little bit more akin to to Allie's in that um, you know, I went to law school, I was dabbling in a couple different areas of the law, but I hadn't really nailed down, like this is really what I want to do. In fact, ironically, my my boyfriend, now husband, um, at the time had recommended, oh, you should really get into to the tech space. I think you'd really like it. And I was like, no, that sounds really nerdy. Like, I don't, that, that doesn't sound like something I, I would do and, and look at me now. <laughs> so, um, so yes, I think, you know, the, the reasons that I really got into this space is just, the nature of it, like it's so dynamic, it's uh, constantly changing. It's you know the law can never really keep up with technology, and so working in this space, I think, is always a creative exercise as well. Whereas I think often in the law and policy space, especially in legal, um, you end up in these roles that feel like a little bit more of a check the box exercise. Like okay, cool, like you can't do this, and you know here's the rule you have to follow, and now we're done, right? Whereas when when the law really can't keep up with the technology, you're really operating in this gray space that you kind of have to think forward 10 steps ahead and say, okay, if I'm advising this company or if I'm advocating for consumers or whatever my role is, how do I think about where, where the direction of the policy is going and the law is going and how do I 
um, you know, think about that from a strategic perspective, right? So I've also, also always really enjoyed that. Um, I also really enjoyed the people aspect of it. So one, um, <laughs> one, one area that I was really interested in when I first went to law school was actually immigration law. And that was actually one kind of overlap of why I kind of pivoted into this space a little bit too, is like, there's this sort of very um, kind of people oriented aspect of like the ethics involved or like data privacy, you know, personal information issues and things like that. And, you know, ultimately, even though we are talking about technology, it's really about how are we using the, the, these technologies in ways that benefit people or don't benefit people <laughs> or benefit companies, government, and, and how are we using that to kind of move forward as a as society, right? Um, so all that is to say that I think it's a super exciting space. And, you know, for anybody that either is involved or wants to get involved in that space, I highly recommend it. Thank you for no. sharing that. And I think that all of uh, your points hit on the really interdisciplinary nature of work in this space and how uh, important it is for a diversity of perspectives and backgrounds uh, to, to be doing this work. Um, so now I'll pass it off to Arpita to ask the next question. Thanks, Rima. Um, I think a lot of people, and especially uh, the Foundry class, would want to know about um, what your experience of being a Foundry Fellow was, um, how did you find out about it, and what were the biggest takeaways that you had from the fellowship, and um, how, how was your um, experience engaging with um, other people, your peers, and those in this space? And I think we can just go in the same order. Sure. Um, I honestly, I think I found out from one of my coworkers at the think tank I was at previously and I applied, I got in, it was the second inaugural class and I thought it was a great opportunity because when I moved to DC, I truly didn't know anyone here. All of my law school friends were in New York or London and uh, I didn't know anyone in the tech policy ecosystem to begin with. So it was a great, obviously way to meet everyone. Like I'm an alley, you know, and also just, to know, to find out how the tech policy ecosystem worked, what were the organizations, what were their positions, because a lot of the Foundry Fellows are, you know, working in DC, and I think that's one of the more growing challenges and goals is to be more global, uh, but a lot of people are based in DC, and well, well, the little DC tech policy scene is a pretty welcoming space, so that was amazing, and I also found that, you know, people I met were all about in the same place in our careers and you grow together, you got, get so many opportunities out of this network. People invite you to a panel, people invite you to talk to their interns or someone says, hey, we actually have an, a position open. Do you have anyone in mind? Or maybe you're interested in this job. And it's been a great career development tool. And it's also been just a great social tool to be honest, I met a lot of friends through the foundry who are wonderful people. And especially when you move to a city where you don't know anyone, um, that was very beneficial. That's great. Yeah, um, I, I, totally, I totally agree. I think uh, we're being pretty DC heavy. I actually don't know where everyone else on, on this panel is based, but it seems like it's really been, um, been growing in, in the, the Bay Area, New York, um, other, other areas of the, of the country. And I think there actually might be some, um, some additional like international fellows this time. So it, it does seem like like it's 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 continuing to grow outside of, of our, our DC bubble, but there is a really great community here um, where we uh, just a few weeks ago um, after the State of the Net had the, the annual Foundry tri Trivia Night, which is a, a, a really great time to get to uh, all be together and celebrate how much of a tech policy nerd we, we all are. Uh, so I so my story with the Foundry yeah, is a little bit unique because I and I heard of it before while I was in the process of, of being, being founded. I, um, and I was just so excited because it, and it's really grown to be um, what um, what we hoped it would be, which is like similar to, uh, unlike unlike bar associations tend to be, um, which are just for lawyers and, and then like, I guess, law student members. It really is, um, it's broader than that in that it's it's, it's not just lawyers, it's, it's policy folks, it, it's um, tech experts, et cetera, but also um, it's not as like, 
top down. It's really bottom up. So people have this, this platform um, to be able to put on events like this, to be able to um, start create, generate additional content such as um, the, the Foundry podcast that I think is getting to be restarted, the um, blog content, um, the social social events like policy panels. And, and I'm sure that people will come up with uh, other new creative ideas to, to, to use this, this brand and, and um, this network and, and these resources and to put ourselves on the panels instead of having to um, them to just be like the, mo the most senior people. So I think it really is a great tool to be able to um, be productive and, and to make these connections that like we're going to be running things someday. So it's, it's cool to, to, um, to have, we all get to know each other while we're um, young and hungry and excited and um, building these relationships that we'll continue to have in our careers as well as our personal lives and, and our friends. Um, and the other great thing about the Foundry, um, the, the reason I heard about it was I used to run this, I, um, I love talking to students and um, uh, and uh, recent alums and, and felt like I would always talk to really great people and um, that I have to remember like, who did I said I would send like a telecom job to? Like it was just, uh, finally I was just like, a, uh, I tweeted it, put it on my LinkedIn. I was just like, I'm just gonna make one Google doc and I point everyone to here. Um, and after a while um, it got uh, unwieldy and, and now it lives on the Foundry website in a much more, um, a much better looking job board. And I'm just so, so glad that that, continues to be a resource for so many people um, for jobs and internships. And um, if you're if you're not familiar, it's on the Foundry website. We can put the link in the chat. But um, it really it really has been um, such a joy to see that continue to be a resource for people who are just getting into the space. And have, when people tell me they tell us they got jobs from it, it's, it's really exciting. So it is great to be able to have that as a really um, great tool and resource. And um, yeah, so Thank you to, to in the chat. Um, but yeah, I'm so glad that the Foundry is continuing to um, take on awesome new fellows like you guys and can't see, wait to see what you continue to do with it. So welcome, go team. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for me, I think I learned about, you know, <laughs> now, now that I'm being asked this question, I honestly can't even remember for sure because I feel like I've met so many people through the Foundry that now just become part of my life. <laughs> but uh, I, I did a legal fellowship at the Wikimedia Foundation and there were a couple other people there that were previous Foundry members that, that were like, oh, this is a really great organization, you should check it out. And at the time I didn't think much of it. I, I checked it out, it looked seemed kind of cool. I joined um, and then since then, I think it's been such a great, you know, to, to both Allie's and, and Ash has points, like it's such a great community of people where um, you know, like I moved to the Bay Area in 2015, and while I knew a number of people here, a lot of my friends here were more on the product and engineering side, and not so much in the legal legal and policy space. And so it was a great way to meet a lot of people in that space, especially kind of focused in this in this technology realm. Um, and and then you know, as I started getting to know people, just forming a little bit of a community within that. So as people mentioned, like opportunities for jobs, opportunities for panels and events, and even just like getting to know people, right? Like I think, you know, a lot of times these, these um, there's like a lot of focus on like what the opportunity is from, from like a personal perspective, but it also becomes a little bit more about um, like what you can, can get out of it from a more ongoing perspective too. So for example, like if, if I, know other people that work in a similar space as me and, and I want to know how they're handling things from a work perspective for benchmarking like I can do that too right it's not just about like getting a new job or or you know something like that so so I think it's been really fun from that perspective um and I think a lot of the cities that were mentioned before this are definitely are kind of melting pots in, in ways that you know people kind of move to a new area that might be might be a spot where you don't necessarily have that kind of built-in professional community and so this is a great way to to build um both professional and personal friendships i think thank you so much i think it's it's really great to have all of you part of the foundry family and this legacy is so so amazing and i think rima and i hope to kind of take this forward and be able to support the entire foundry community like you are doing today so we'll go to, um, I'll pass it back to Rima for um, another question and um, we can then take audience questions. Yeah, and if you're listening in,
please make sure to submit any questions you have to the Q&A function um, and feel free to submit them now or when we when we start that uh, Q&A, audience Q&A phase. Um, so acknowledging that it's Women's History Month and that there is this need for diversity and uh, different perspectives, different intersecting identities within the tech ecosystem. Uh, how do your identities um, play into your career journey and your experience within this field? And what kind of support do you think women and women of color uh, need in this ecosystem? And how do you think the current class of uh, ILP fellows and you know anyone listening in can contribute to uh, to this notion of support. Are we going in the same order? Let's do it. Sure. Um, I think my identity definitely contributes just because of what I explained about how I ended up, you know, doing tech policy. On top of it, I'm an immigrant. I am seven years into the United States, I've been on a bunch of different visas. If anyone in the Foundry community is also an immigrant, I'm happy to talk to you about all of these processes and experiences, but I think it obviously shapes how I view certain issues um, and how I view certain conversations. When it comes to supporting women and people of color, I mean, obviously I think we need more intersectionality when it comes to tech policy in general. I think we've had a lot of conversations that are more like, women in tech policy, we need to make sure there's like a woman on a panel, you know, like a lot of a lot of professionals have been more cognizant of that, but that doesn't go far enough. So the, the next kind of step, the next goal should be the intersectionality. And um, I think there are two ways we can all contribute. One is just personal, right? So we meet a lot of people through these networks and share your advice, share your connections. It always comes back 10 times, I can promise you. And I, it's not even the word of like mentorship. I have mentees, but sometimes it's just as good as having doing an introduction or telling someone about an event. Um, obviously, if you're in a position where you're organizing events, make sure the panelists are diverse. I promise you there are so many incredible experts in this field. It's not just white dudes. Um, and the second piece of this is more, it's harder because it's more institutional, right? When I just started in DC, sometimes I felt uncomfortable calling out certain groups or institutions because they had panels um, or like all white panels. And honestly, to this day, sometimes you kind of have to evaluate in your head and do like an equation about like, how will this affect my career? You have to be pretty, you know, high on top of the tech policy pyramid or your career to feel comfortable saying things and thinking that it won't affect your journey down the line. So that's an equation that's very hard to kind of crack. But having, if you are part of these institutions, having the conversations internally or contributing while also understanding that this is not as easy as saying, hey, like, let's have, let's make sure we're always diverse when it comes to panels, when it comes to fellowships, when it comes to hiring. But those are kind of the individual and the more corporate or institutional to what groups of goals I, I see when I think about this. Now that was um, a great question. And, and um, that was, yeah, a lot, um, definitely echo a lot of, of what Ash said. I, I think, um, yeah, like there's, we're, I mean, we still see mantles, we still, and then, or they like add one white woman, does, does, like that's not, that's not enough. But I think, um, I, I think that a lot of it, just like, a lot of it just has to be like one step at a time. So tr making an effort to, um, to mentor more people to that don't, maybe don't look like you or, and, and to, um, to try to like, I, I've had so many great mentors um, throughout law school and in, in my career. And I really, um, as I said before, I uh, worked on the, creating this, this um, job board resource and I really do like to, to pay it forward. And so um, anyone who wants to, to talk to me, I'm always happy to, to chat. I can, um, can give you my email, but I, I'll, I'll talk to anyone. Um, I do think that um, trying to, to be uh, like accessible and trying to, um, you're not gonna be able to like change everything, but making an effort to, um, 
to try to be more inclusive when you are the ones planning the panel, when you are the ones doing the hiring, um, uh, just uh, one one step at a time. But I think that's something that I I um, am mindful of as I when I do have the opportunities to to plan things or to try to um, to, to talk to students and 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 be more inclusive. And so I um, definitely appreciate how um, the the effort that's been been done here to um, to showcase the the diverse diversity within the boundary. And and if you look at the the website, we I I think that the foundry's done a great job at recruiting um, a lot of different um, diverse um, perspectives, diverse backgrounds, um, uh, all um, all different types of, um, I think there are, yeah, I think it really shows a commitment to how how broad um, the, the experts are with, within our community. And that's something you maybe see more for the junior folks. And then it's the, the more senior people get, it doesn't always look, look like that. But I think that as our, um, generations continue to, to um, uh, excel, um, grow in this field, I think we will see things start to look um, more like the early career people stuff and hopefully people won't be like, feel pushed out or feel like they don't belong and, and kind of create a more inclusive um, environment um, in the, for the executives and, and, and senior folks, not just the, um, the, the early career folks that are more represented in the, in the foundry. But I'm hopeful and I'm excited. And I think there's a lot of um, so many great women of color in the foundry and I can't wait to continue to see all the awesome things that everyone gets to, to do in their careers. Thanks both. I think those are really great points. And you know, when I hear a question like this, I actually like to think, step back and think like, why is this important, right? Um, and I think a lot of this has to do with why a an organization like the Foundry is created in the first place, right? To create networks and opportunities and um, communities, um, especially when there are groups that may not necessarily have that, right? Like, um, you know, talking about being not just women, right? Being an immigrant, being the first person in your family to, to go to college, being uh, like, for me, one thing I thought about a lot is like, uh, I became a parent a year and a half ago and, um, <laughs> I just had lunch with some of my coworkers for the first time in two years, right? After, you know, all the all the COVID fun. And we were talking about how a couple of people have become parents in that group. And we were talking about how becoming a parent just automatically lowers your IQ because you're just so exhausted, right? <laughs> and so I think like there's so many different groups that it it's helpful to to have communities like this where you can learn from each other, where you can support one another, and where you can um, kind of help each other move forward in your careers. And so I think, um, you know, women, women of color is like one group within that, that I think really benefits from, from group like the Foundry. Yeah, thank you. I think you all touch on some really important points. Uh, so I'll pass back to Arbitha. Yes, so I think we can take questions from the audience now. And our first question is from Alvaro, who is asking, um, tech has created a bunch of opportunities, but it's often difficult to navigate. Um, could you speak about your experiences with mentorship and um, what you know other fellows, people looking to enter into the space kind of um, look for when they're trying to um, pivot or enter the ecosystem? So I think there, wonderful people who know exactly where they want their career to be in 10 years. I never was one of them. I think partially because I live in these spurs of how long do I have a visa for? Like, it's like three years. What can I do in these three years? And then I have like two more years. And so my, my kind of head never went as far as like five years out, 10 year plan. Um, so I, but advice for them would be, if you do know what you want to be in 10 years, find the person who has the job you want or something similar and connect and see if they can be a mentor. 90% of the time, people are very welcoming and they love helping. And if you don't, you can do more something what I have done, which is a little more chaotic where you just meet a lot of people and you talk to a lot of people. And honestly, I don't think, and, and this is my bad, but I've never seeked out mentors directly. They just kind of all came to me and they offered themselves help and advice 
and that was so wonderful. So I try to do that too. Um, I'll take any opportunity to talk uh, to law students or college students um, at any time. I literally a month ago was talking to students in Germany over Zoom and it was a wonderful experience and they have such a different perspective on tech policy. So, um, and, and when they come up to me or later, a few months later, they ask me questions, like that's how I connect to them. Uh, but I'm always proactively, you know, suggesting that you do seek out mentors or just friends and mentors don't have to be someone who's as, you know, many years out developed from where you are in your life. Uh, a lot of my friends who are about on the same level of their career are my mentors because either they work in the same area and they have great perspectives and great knowledge, or they work, let's say, in privacy or antitrust, and they just have all of this knowledge that I don't think I can ever acquire. And th that's kind of like more, I guess, horizontal mentorship. I don't know if that's a word. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I see mentorship. Like if you know exactly what you want, that's amazing. It makes it so much easier. And if you wanna be a little more chaotic and just like make a ton of friends and see how that works out, I recommend it too. Yeah, uh, no, that, that, that's a great point. I, I think that like um, sometimes saying you wanna like do tech, like and especially if like you're talking to like a family member or someone that's not in this space that might sound like oh that's so narrow but then if you're if you're actually like in this um like one of my my professors he would always say like he'd be like even saying you want to do ip or copyright like that's that's still so broad i have like a huge rolodex like i need to know who to tell you so you, like what specifically you want to do like nominative fair use and trademark law like just like you have to find like your niche and like your um and it, it, it's, it's useful to have like something specific if you're trying to tell people like what you, the kind of people that you're trying to, to meet and be connected to and the kind of opportunities you want, which um, the one great thing about tech also is that, that it is that broad. So you can have a few different um, interests with, within this space and then, uh, and be more open and move around. And um, there's often like a lot of overlap between different kinds of um, subject matter areas and, and skills as well. Um, but I think that, where, where the question was? Um, yeah, but I, I think that like mentorship yeah, I don't always know like if I'm becoming someone's mentor. Is it like when I email back and forth a couple times? Like, am I am I your mentor now? Like, sure, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to be a resource. I think that um, like the especially during the, the pandemic, but um, it's all it's even easier to be able to like hop on a call or a Zoom than like having to take time out of my day to go get coffee. Even though, um, but uh, so yeah, like, I think like cold reaching out to people um, uh, through like through something like LinkedIn or um, or like or other kinds of um, social media, but Twitter, Twitter <laughs> yeah, Twitter. I made, I've made a lot of friends on Twitter, <laughs> sliding into the DMs. Like um, a lot of people um, from the foundry, I, I first met over Twitter um, for, um, if I even met them in real life. But um, yeah, I, I think like, um, or like you can get me, you can get people's emails, business cards, if that's still, still a thing, but like try actually following up and, and, and adding someone on LinkedIn or following them on Twitter and, and staying in touch and, and um, trying to take advantage of um, building those kinds of um, online relationships that can become offline stuff too, or even just like someone that you email once in a while. Um, I think that like people, there are people that I hear from once and there are people that like follow up. And uh, again, I'm just, maybe I'm not sure like <laughs> who considers me a, a, a mentor, but I, I do think that um, uh, not everyone is going to maybe be as open to that as, as I am, but there are people like me and I'm, and um, people, maybe if you have something in common, you went to the same um, undergrad or graduate school and you, or you have some other kind of connection, but um, uh, yeah, you can, I mean, you can learn a lot about someone from um, speak, uh, hearing them speak on a panel or, or, or seeing their um, social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera. But also um, one thing I often, like I think can be helpful is, is reading people's bios or reading people or even like reading job descriptions. I, th I think some of that can be useful to see the kind of um, paths someone took or the kinds of um, skills and, and, and how they, they got to where they are and see how like that fits into your your puzzle too and, and um, uh, how, how you can navigate this like ever evolving tech space and and um find, find your your path as well and again that changes all the time um but that's one of the um i think fun things about this um interdisciplinary uh, interesting area so uh yeah I would, I would say just like use the tools that are out there and then try to 
follow up. And if someone didn't respond to your email, it doesn't mean they're ignoring you. They might've just missed it and you can always follow up again. But um, yeah, try, try to, um, you really can make meet a lot of great friends and connections in this space. And that's something I've done. And so that's why I like to, to pay it forward as well. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll echo a little bit of what, um, you know, my co-panelist said, like, if I think about kind of in hindsight, hindsight's supposedly 2020, uh, you, don't, you don't know what you don't know, especially when you're starting out. And so the more that you can learn about some of the different career trajectories out there and keep an open mind about those, the better. Um, you know, like I gave the example, even just about myself, but how I went into law school thinking, Oh, I might do immigration law or I might do litigation and and then you know I, I haven't done either of those things so <laughs> and I'm really enjoying it right but that that took some flexibility in terms of okay here's my goal and maybe I pursue that goal but I start veering away from that but that's okay right like if I think to Ali's point like um kind of being flexible and uh, like talking to different people and learning about what's out there I think is is really helpful and then also thinking thinking through like um like what are what are when you do talk to people like what are the ways to get to where you do want to go um because i think there are often a lot of different paths and while there may be traditional paths to get to to a certain job that's not always the only way so i think keeping that in mind as well um so so i'll give you some for myself, for example, like most people that have a job like mine probably worked in like a big law firm for a few years at least before doing it. I didn't do that, right? And that is the more traditional path. And, um, you know, maybe maybe that's in quote unquote easier way to do it, but it's not the only way, right? So I think thinking again, that's why I also have to talk to different people and see like how do they get to where they are. Um, and then um, third thing I'll just say is I I also again you know in hindsight looking back I I do really appreciate that like there are a lot a lot of people that are willing to chat with you even if you don't have an alumni connection or something like that um, so doing the cold reach outs is is totally worth it um, so for I'll give you an example uh, <laughs> several years ago when I was when I was applying for a new job, there was this startup that I was really interested in. And um, I saw a posting there and I emailed the CEO and I said, hey, I'm really in CEO slash co-founder. And I said, hey, I'm really interested in this role at your company. I think you're doing cool things for X, Y, and Z reasons. We'd be open to chatting for a little bit. And I went in thinking, okay, he's probably not gonna respond. Like he's got much better things to do than talk to such a, a baby lawyer like me. Um, and he he said, let's meet for coffee. And then next thing I knew, I was talking to general counsel about, about this role, right? And so again, I think like taking those kinds of shots and saying, you know, what do I have to lose? Worst case, they don't respond or they say no. And it is what it is, right? But but the opportunities that could come from those types of reach outs, I think are are really valuable. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think you all touch on uh, a really, really important point of how now since uh, since the pandemic began and we've transitioned to leaning on these virtual platforms for communication so much more uh, that we're no longer siloed into geographical, uh, being geographically tethered to, to people within that community and we can really expand. Um, our networks and our horizons just beyond where where we might happen to be at a certain time. I think that's that's really exciting. And so, on that note, um, considering the the more digital nature of our society and how that trajectory just seems to be on the rise, how do you keep up with uh, current news and, and recent developments within your respective fields? Um, and you know, given the proliferation of information online, um, how do you sort of filter or prioritize uh, 
the most key information to stay up to date and really develop your expertise? There is definitely depends, right? So some some people in tech policy, and I used to be more of a generalist, and I used to work on five different tech policy issue areas. Right now, I'm more content regulation heavy. Um, but there's always when you start reading and getting into your area, you identify thought leaders or experts, you follow them on platforms, you follow them on SSRN. Um, and that gives you a lot of information. Then on top of it, there are organizations, right, like CCIA, they are industry groups, but also through social media post about, you know, litigation cases that are happening that are developing in your policy area, any news that might be there. I honestly kind of combine all of that together. And when you also start building these networks, it just automatically happens. I wish it was more organized. I tried at one point, like having like a spreadsheet and trying to track all the developments, but at least with content regulation, it's borderline impossible. Maybe if it was more narrow, it would be. So again, I guess my answer to a lot of these questions is it's a little chaotic. It's a little chaotic um, and you always got to take care of yourself. And I think the question, which was a great question in the Q&A section, uh, was also about just like global events and global events are overwhelming. So I insist on everyone taking care of themselves and sometimes unplugging from the Twitters and the news feeds of the world and just taking a second to recharge because there's just so many battles ahead of us, um, both on just global, you know, level and in policy in general. So just take care of yourselves. Great advice. Yeah, I um, no, it can be it can be overwhelming. There, there's these are really active policy areas right now. Um, at, like, I think as we said before, like the federal level, both like. Um, all the branches of government, what's happening in Congress, what's happening in their regulatory space and the agencies, um, litigation, uh, not to mention the, all the different states and all the, and the EU and all the member states and other parts of the world. It's just yeah, really active tech regulation efforts right now that um, are, can, be, can be overwhelming. So I, I think finding ways that um, filter and, and can help you like prioritize um, what is like likely to go anywhere, what is likely to um, but the, the time, like what's your, what the fire is, is like the top right now. Um, I think that, I mean, there are things like just following the, these different experts on, on, on Twitter and LinkedIn, there are different um, newsletters, a lot of great journalism in, the, in this space, things like Politico's Morning Tech. Uh, I think they're rebranding it soon with a different name, but yeah, there, there are lots of different um, newsletters that people find um, helpful to try to, to filter this out. And as, as Ash said, um, uh, for, for our member companies, we, we provide this, this, these kinds of, of tools to trying to um, do a roundup of, of what's going on in, in um, all the different uh, policymaking areas that we're, that we're tracking right now. So um, just, I guess that's just something that's more like applicable to everyone. Yeah, just trying to, to, to follow the, um, the different experts. I think something that, that's fun is like, uh, a lot of a lot of scholars and professors are, are really active on Twitter. So when when there's something like a hearing, everyone's live tweeting or a, a, an opinion in a Supreme Court case comes down, and it's just like um, it, they're likely to type out their, their thoughts there before um, before they have time to turn something into a law review article that takes that takes months later. So I do feel like uh, social media can be can be a great tool to, to follow along. Um, just the as things are are happening um, in all parts of the world. Um, and entertainment, but also in, in tech policy too. You just have to follow the right people. And um, I think Foundry might actually have some, I'm not sure um, if they've been updated with the, the latest class, but um, some lists where you, you can follow all of the, the tweets from our excellent fellows as well, who I'm sure are sharing, I'm tweeting and retweeting things that I'm um, sharing on LinkedIn, all the, all the platforms, um, all this uh, useful content from, from themselves too. So. Oh, those are my those are my thoughts. I hope that's helpful. You just, triggered, you just triggered my memory. Also, academic centers at universities. There are quite few now um, in the EU and in the US and Canada that do tech policy, like Stanford, mm -hmm. UCLA, Yale ISP. 
so the university centers, uh, Harvard, like they all have websites, they all have Twitter accounts and LinkedIn accounts, I believe. So those are also very helpful when, if you don't know which like scholars to start with, we just yeah. go to the university center and go from there. That's a great point. And then like, I mean, we haven't talked about like podcasts either, other, other like a lot of great stuff in that space, but um, maybe also something for the foundry to work on a project on trying to filter all of the, all of the stuff um, and find it, find it useful in a, whatever media format um, email newsletter podcast whatever so something to think about <laughs> yeah I was gonna say that could be a if it's not already happening that could be a, actually be a cool resource from a foundry standpoint of have like a go-to list of like blogs or newsletters or people to to follow including including our awesome fellows um but but also just scholars and uh leaders out there that that do have good content um I, I, I do think it's, it's really interesting when you, when you do look at the stuff, like I will plus one to say that it is chaotic for sure. And, you know, I'm, I'm part of this group of senior attorneys that work on like privacy and product law. And literally last month, this was one of our discussion points is how do you actually keep track of all the stuff happening, especially on a global scale? And the reality is you you can't right like there's just not enough hours in the day but but a lot of people do have like in some more concrete perspective people do have you know they might set aside 20 minutes every day to see okay like what's the latest in the news when it comes to this stuff and so um when you do start following people keep paying attention to who they are also quoting whether it's on twitter linkedin the the blogs that you see a lot of law firms also have great um like newsletters and blogs on specific topics if you're looking for um, specific things. So um, I, I think it does help to narrow down a little bit. Like when you say something like tech law or tech policy, it, it, it can be pretty broad. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I think trying to narrow down a little bit to say, okay, am I looking at um, privacy law? Am I looking at like export issues? Am I looking at um you know content moderation like what is what are some of the kind of sub headings i'm looking at and then kind of searching a little bit based on that that can can help a lot but yeah i think kind of figuring out what works for you within your schedule is all, and then what's realistic is also good and then having having some like go-to people in your network which again you know foundry is great for this type of thing um having some go-to people in, in your network to say like okay i wanted to learn more about um like what's happening in the antitrust space with fang companies right now like who can i go to for this right um i think like understanding what you're looking for helps a lot there too but yeah it is it is really hard problem i think even a lot of very experienced people don't know how to do that well <laughs> thank you thank you um i know we're at time but i think um before we go to the closing remarks um can we just get one quick like best piece of advice you would have for um the current fellows to make most of the fellowship um and before i pass it on to rima thank you everyone for joining us sharing your experiences and your insights and um thank you to all the attendees who could make it um we really appreciate all of your presence today um so we could just go around the room um and yeah. My biggest piece of advice, I guess, would be when I first joined, I was a little bit intimidated by everyone because everyone had incredible backgrounds and all of this experience. And it, sometimes it felt like I, I was scared to ask a question or reach out because I felt like, you know, I was just like this little think tank policy person. And some people were so much more far um, developed in their career or have done so many incredible things. And just don't, I feel like we didn't talk about the imposter syndrome, but I think it, it runs deep uh, in the tech policy ecosystem. And just, I think a lot of women suffer from it. So just, just make sure you don't pay attention to that little voice, reach out 90% of the time, people are nice and they will be great to you. And the 10% will just show you that the other 90% are great. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, thanks again for, for having me. This is, this is a great panel. Um, I would encourage people to, to just try to 
I know we're all really busy and so there, um, there's different amounts of how involved you can be, but just like try to get in the Slack. I don't know if there's still an email list, but I think that the Slack is where a lot of the, the conversations are happening and try to um, make some friends and, and uh, see if you like, you don't have to, you don't have to do everything, but I think there um, are so many different ways that you can get involved um, and, and be part of the community um, and just like, yeah, I guess imposter syndrome is a, a great point. Um, but like, you belong. You were you you're part of this community, and um, hope that you can uh, make some great great connections. Um, as we said, like professionally, but also also make some great friends because we that's something that that sounds like Ash and I have done, and I hope that you all can do that too because it's a these we're we're fun when when we're not even outside of work and even at work we're, we're fun too so <laughs> welcome and um can't wait to see what you do with it yeah i know i i love both those points <laughs> um i i would say just like many things in life i think you get out of this what you put into it and so you know in my experience with the foundry like there were i was probably somewhere in the middle ground like there were a lot of people that were super busy and you know I'm sure with, with all the great intent, but just didn't have time to like do a lot with it. There are a lot of people that were super involved. Um, and, you know, I think that the more that you can get involved, even like I mentioned, if it's like Slack messages here or there, do a happy hour if there are people that are local, like some some small things like that, they actually go a long way because you do really learn a lot about what's out there from a professional perspective. You meet some cool people as friends. You um, you know, I, you, there's a lot to be gained from that, I think, um, for what it's worth. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And yeah, and to, to Ashkin's point, like, don't, don't be afraid to, to reach out to people or to, to kind of put your voice out there because people are super nice. That's amazing advice. Thank you. Um, and I'll pass it on to Rima so that she can um, close this event. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to all of our amazing panelists. I think this was a really impactful conversation and a lot of great takeaways and uh, you know, points of action that we can all take to, to you know, preserve the mission of Women's History Month uh, for the rest of the year, you know, as, as we go forward and as March closes out. And so, Thank you so much to everyone for, for being here and for joining us for our first ever event. There's lots more to come. Um, I wanna say a huge thank you to Justin Pung for putting together um, this event, being a fantastic ally and doing so much work uh, to make this a great success. Also, thank you to Ricky George and uh, Arpatha, my wonderful co-moderator. Um, and all of the, the fellows who have been amazing in supporting uh, this event and sharing the word. Um, definitely, definitely appreciate it. Um, so I will drop a couple of links in the chat. If you're not a fellow and you would like to learn more about the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, um, make sure to follow the Foundry on Twitter and LinkedIn to get the most up-to-date information about our next activities and events coming up, as well as uh, the recording to this session. If you hopped in late or wanna go back to it later, um, we'll probably post some information on those social accounts about where you can find this recording. Um, so thank you all so much. Have a lovely rest of your day and we'll see you at the next one. <laughs>